Some people say that diamonds don't grow on trees. Those people are wrong. Welcome back to Norath. We're here in the Stonebrunt Mountains today, just south of Arudin, because I wanted to show you the new tree I've installed here. It is, of course, an enchanted tree, because as you can see, it's made of diamonds. This is just a fun idea I had that I wanted to try out. I placed it, of course, in the Stonebrunt Mountains here on the continent of Otis. And as you can see here, we have succulent diamond fruits hanging from glass stems with glass and lapis leaves and of course the bark for this tree is made out of diamond ore and as you can see the harvest here is very plentiful i don't know about you but this is something i always dreamed about having in minecraft so i added just one of them in my norath world here so while you can see that diamonds do indeed grow on trees. They only grow on this tree. And I think around here we might put some houses or a... Probably an Asian-themed monastery is going to go somewhere in these snowy peaks. But we will leave the tree behind for now. You can come visit it whenever the next world download is posted. But we will return north because we have to go back to Arudin because I have a lot of things to show you today. In fact, this episode is going to be pretty packed with several things. We're even going to take a short trip over to Koinos and I'm going to show you the outlines of what I've been doing to expand the map for the Lucklin expansion that's coming up. So here we have Arudin coming into view again. You, of course, remember all the city walls from last time, except you can immediately already notice that we have a lot of new and larger structures on the inside to take a look at. But we're not going to look at those just yet. We're going to take a look at these interesting farmhouses out here. If you remember from when I started developing Freeport, there were farm fields and houses outside of the city. And that is going to be true for this area as well. So let's land and take a look at some of the smaller houses before we take a look at the larger ones. Now, the small houses here are done in a characteristic sort of Asian timber frame design, except they've got, I think I used uh, clay for the walls here, just regular clay. And of course they have the pitched and pointy curvy roofs, except they're on a smaller scale, so you have to use your imagination a bit more. But they are, of course, done in the same design and materials. And this particular house is a two-story affair. And if we go inside here, we have a nice clean obsidian floor. And some lights on the walls here with the timber frame ceiling. We even have a little side room over here. And I haven't done the interiors on these, so there's no way to get up to the second level yet, but that's something we're going to be working on. Another thing around here you will have noticed are these things, which are grain silos. So instead of having the barns over here, I've elected to have them build large grain silos. And if we lower down here and we can see that they are in fact filled to the brim with grain. And we've got a ladder to access it up here so we can get to the top to place in even more grain up here. And I think each farmhouse will have at least one grain silo. This one has two because it's a bit of a larger house on a larger farm plot here. I haven't exactly worked out how to do the fields here, but I'm thinking about doing the water arrangements in a bit of a different way that more follow the landscapes around here. So I like to preserve the topography when possible. There's also a large central road here with smaller roads going out of it. This leads down to the Toxilia forest over there. 
On the other end of this, I'm thinking about putting a watchtower on the other end of the road here, where it meets the forest. And I'll probably form that out of a wall segment, probably a two-tier wall segment like that. I haven't exactly finished the watchtower design for that yet, though. Uh, but without further ado, let us now go inside the city, because we have a lot of interesting things to take a look at in here. So, the first thing you'll notice is I have built up the central platform for the Great Library of Arudin just a little bit more. I think in the next episode I will actually place the structure that is going to be here so you can see what it is now that I've gotten more things built around here. Uh, and I'm very excited for you to see this. I haven't uh, shown it before even though I've had it built for a little while. And it's going to be really neat. Uh, let's see, we have this uh, structure here, it's got a little, sort of a, um, a nice pool out in front of it. I think I need to put some, definitely some lily pads and some flowers in here to help decorate the area. But it's got a little footbridge that you can uh, go across here. One of those uh, low-profile uh, pitched Asian bridges like that. Of course, it's all made out of uh, quartz. Uh, but this structure back here, I have not decided what all of these structures should be. Like, one of them definitely needs, needs to be a bank. I don't know if that one over there should be a bank, or perhaps this more impressive one here should be the bank. Of course, we need several guild towers and many shops and marketplaces and all the good stuff we have in the other cities, except done in the style that we have going on here. And let me just give you a bit of a closer look. You can see um, a characteristic we're going to have, which is going to be these red paper lanterns. They're going to be everywhere, pretty much. You can see some over here, except they're just glowstone, because as I get closer, the render distance sort of uh, kills the effect when you get too far away, because it unloads them, but I suppose we'll just have to live with that. Uh, because the banners, when you do them and just hang them one over another like this, in this pattern, give a very nice and pleasing sort of Asian paper lantern effect. I'll give you a good look at this if you want to copy it in your own worlds. Now, I suppose I should also go inside of this real quickly. I haven't actually added the door, so we're gonna have to break in. And uh, it's not very well lit in here because I haven't optimized that either, but as you can see here, we have many paper lanterns and uh, interior columns. And dark obsidian floor. And we actually have a uh, prismarine uh, wood coffered ceiling up here as well. But it doesn't show up in the video at the moment. Because, the, as I said, the lighting is not optimized. Uh, but this building is pretty much empty. It's just several s sections are stacked on top of each other. We've got one, two, three, four such sections. We'll go up here to the top, and this one, instead of, is because it's a very prominent building, instead of having prismarine accents, it has uh, golden accents. This is uh, the gold block in my texture pack. I made it look sort of like more yellow, but with um, actual gold bricks and uh, bars stacked on top of each other to give a more pleasing effect. Although some people mistake it for the sponge block. I can, I can understand that. But if we go up here, we then have the uh, roof uh, finales up here. It's sort of like uh, swan's heads facing each other is, I believe, what these are supposed to be. Uh, that's what I tried to model them after anyway. I took that detail from the uh, Tang Dynasty Daming Palace. Which is what the general style of this city is based on, by the way. 
And here's the view from the side here. We even have a little porch pavilion up here. We could walk along and stand on and, and view the city from up here. And as you can see, we have the top sections, and as you go further down, they get taller. Or conversely, as you go higher up, they get shorter. And that's generally something I do with my buildings like this, to sort of vary things. Instead of just straight stacking them, I vary the height a little to make it a little bit more interesting to look at. And I suppose I should give you a good view of these things on the side here. Someday I hope to do a tutorial that will describe how to do these things here, but as you can see, I mean this is this is some of the most intricate building work I've done. Because the way the Asian type buildings of this architectural style are constructed is sort of like uh, Lincoln Logs actually. They're sort of stacked on top of each other, but they're all interlocking. And they're all designed in such a way that they all link together and all the weight is put on the pillars here, the wooden pillars. And the wooden pillars themselves are just put on little stone pads. And I put them on bedrock pads. But the reason they do this is because it makes a very earthquake-proof structure. So that means if the ground starts moving and shaking the building, since these are sort of dry stacked on top of each other, but they're interlocking, it means the building is just, just sort of shakes and wiggles around. But it does hold together, which is pretty neat. And um, so it's a fun fact for you. And over here, I have a smaller version. They're made to sort of two major sizes I've built. I've just shown you the large ones, but I've also got a sort of medium-sized ones here. And I've chopped this one in half, so you can see better on the inside what's going on here. We have a lot of columns in here, but bear in mind this is not decorated and not finished. It's just it's structurally complete, but the interiors are yet blank. Now if we go up and take a look at what I've got around here, this is sort of an attic. I don't I suppose that uh, these things should not be here this high up. And of course we got a yet another little attic up here with all the wooden beams and everything, and I'll give you a view of the profiles down here. We've got a sort of a walkway around here. And the ground floor around here. And more simplified um, raised corners around here. Uh, but I haven't decided if this building is going to be staying there in that present position. It's just a reference model that I put down to show you. And while we're over here, let's take a look around the gate area because I've got these statue designs I want to show you over here. You've seen the lion statues, but I made some sort of soldier statues. And of course they're wearing uh, obsidian and jade armor. Pretty neat, I think. I think they go along with the theme anyway. They match the gate quite nicely. And around here I'm just beginning to sort of rough out what I want to do with the regular housing in here. As you can see, it's based on the farmhouse design I showed you outside, except it's a little bit different. It's mostly going to be bigger, but I think the roofs will be similar. I think it will be a mix of the farmhouse roofs, and I'll probably borrow some styles from these ones over here. But, on the edges against the walls, all around through here, and pretty much everywhere there is a space, like there will be a space around here, they will be filled with these sorts of buildings. And I'm going to vary the height. They're going to be not just two stories, but probably three, four, or five stories, something like that. I want to make it look um, sort of very urban and inhabited. 
when we get around to that. I think I've talked about that building enough, so let's give you a view of we got a little pagoda around here. This one's just decorative. And beside it, we have, I think, what is probably going to be probably the uh, Temple of the Tranquil, I think. For those of you that are familiar with Arudin. And for those of you that are not, uh, if memory serves, that is the Monk Guild. And I think I'm probably... I think this needs a bigger entranceway than that. The build, size of the building is overpowering this small one here. Uh, but this building has a feature that it doesn't have a water pool in front of it. It has a water pool that goes all the way around it with a little bridge around back as well. Just something neat I wanted to include for this building. And if I back away a little and go up, we can see that it is another four-tiered building. But its shape is square, and it's got a slightly different design from the previous building we checked out. And it's also got a prismarine on the top here instead of gold. And so we'll take a look at that from the top there. Quite pleased with how this building has come out. It's somewhat inspired from the temple that um, is in Age of Empires. Because I started out with that building down here, but it was only two levels tall, so I started extending it upwards and making it bigger. But I kept the base design pretty much the same. And let's see, what do we got around here? We've got this little octagonal pagoda that is on the sides here. And I'm working on filling in the grass and everything around here also. So we'll land and take a look at this for a moment. We have some red paper lanterns hanging off on the sides here. And the sections of this are pretty much just one section identical to the other, stacked on top of each other, with a roof up here. I think I spent several hours building this thing. I'm pretty pleased with how it came out, actually. It's actually based on an actual structure. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's very old. And it looked pretty cool, so I wanted to have one. In fact, we've got a couple of those. we got another one over there we'll take a look at whenever we get to the palace. Now, while we're over here, we've got this interesting building, which is actually a quadrant of this building but it's rotated and collided and reformatted to have this indentation here in the side of it so it makes a sort of a cross patterned building for the footprint down there but it's uh, three sections stacked on top of each other with a bit of a different roof up here i'm thinking about putting something in the middle but i haven't decided what yet uh, definitely a pinnacle of some sort But it looked really neat, so I wanted to go ahead and have it in the city. Of course, I have no idea what this function of the building is going to be. But we will come up with something. Uh, let's see, what else do we have around here? Let's take a look over here at the Jade Army. This is what I'm going to end up calling these. Uh, because I made two sizes of statue. You can see the original size statue here. Uh, and a twice as big one right beside it or I should say a double sized one uh, you can imagine because he's got gold accents here that this is the officer that is in charge of his platoon preparing to lead them into battle to take a city or something I don't exactly know what I'm going to do with it but it was just pretty cool so I wanted to show it to you Show you around back of this statue here if you want to copy them. It's a pretty simple design. It's very it's based on my previous Roman statue that I did before, except this one is just all straight blocks. It doesn't have any 
stairs or half slabs in it. That's actually something I'm noticing. When I'm doing more statues, I'm not doing them with stairs and half slabs. For some reason, when you can do it with whole blocks and only whole blocks, it, um, it looks quite nice. And let's see, we have this little building here, which is this building here, except just the top part of it. And it's only three levels tall. I have no idea what this building is going to be yet. Uh, we will pick something from a rudin and take a look at it. And over here, let's uh, land over here and give you the full effect of this from the ground. Uh, oh, it's partially obscured by the clouds. Let's get a little closer. So, up here, we have, sticking all the way up to the bill limit, is the lighthouse that is going to be in Rudin, because as you can see, this, this is on the coast. So I have made over here a wall segment that uh, sort of comes out as a foundation, and on top of that, we have this very large and satisfying tower built. And on top of that, we have a double stacked roof segment up here. And somewhere, somewhere in the top of here is going to be a very large light that will serve to guide the ships into the harbor. And it has a similar design to the Temple of the Tranquil that we took a look at earlier. It's very misty up here though. Go down a little bit. And as I've said, this is going to be the lighthouse area because I thought that the docks, I was originally going to have just a small docks area down here by the gate in this area, which I'm still going to have. I've added in the platform for the gate over there. We're going to have bridges and everything and stairs that come down from that. Uh, but I thought that over here, what I really want to do is extend the docks around to this section of the city down here. And I think we can have a sort of a um, anti town type area that is built on stilts that's uh, sort of perched on the ledges of the cliffs here, but also houses and things that are just floating on the surface of the water, and we will have little bridges and everything connecting all those. But that's an idea I have for the far future. I don't think I'm going to have very much of that in place by the time the next map download comes out. Speaking of, while we're around here, I want to introduce you to the trees that I'm going to be using inside of Erudin. As you can see here, we have, uh, I think I chose four types of leaf blocks. This is a little trick you can use on your trees. They don't always have to be the same type of leaf block. You can have four different kinds of leaf block on the same tree to give it texture. And down from that, I have two different colors of glass and end rods down here to give it the full enchanted tree effect that you will, of course, seen from the purple trees that I used in Felwythe. Uh, what I have done is I've taken those trees and I recolored all the materials to be used as sort of uh, peaceful and tranquil enchanted trees to have in Erudin. Uh, as you can also tell, I have randomized the tree trunks with four different kinds of wood blocks as well. They're, they're full bark blocks, as you can tell. So in addition with that and the leaf blocks, when you view them from a distance, they look quite interesting and unique. And as you can see here, there are 10 types of these. So what I do with these is I select one of these or one of those or one of those, and I will randomly drop it somewhere in the city. Uh, but I have not done that as of yet because we're still doing all the active building works in here. Like, I think I will we'll probably put such trees in the corners that you see here. One on each of those corners. And all around the area around the library here, where you see the grass and everything, we're going to ring that with trees around here and there. And a couple over here. Probably a few more over here. And just wherever it would appear to be tasteful 
is where we are going to put the trees. So, there are two parts to the city of Arudin. There is the main part, which I have just taken the last several minutes to show you, and there is also the palace. It is named the Arudin Palace, as you can see here, and this is the gate to it. And if we go through the gate, which I have not cleared out yet, so we'll go around that down here. So if we go through the gate, which is just closed behind us, we find ourselves looking at this here, which is a ramp that goes up this way to a very large structure up here. And this is the Arudin Palace building. Well, actually, the whole complex that is up here is going to be the Arudin Palace. As you can tell, it is substantially higher than the ground level is down here. And sitting on top of that is a very large triple stacked hall. It's done in the same style as the bank building over there, except it's much longer. Uh, and indeed, the bank building is actually just a shortened version of this hall, by the way. So if we go around here, we've got another little pagoda stacked up here in this little section here. It fit perfectly in this little alcove made by the walls, so I thought I would have another one in the city. Except to differentiate it, it's got gold accents up here. And around here we have another large building, which is related to this building I showed you over here. Except it is stacked, uh, how many, what, four tall? And done in a slightly different way. It's part of the Rudin Palace structure we're having up here. We're going to have more buildings up here. But these are the only two I've erected here for the moment. Let me go all the way up here and give you a good bird's eye view of this. So we've got that building there, the large hallway. We're going to, have, we're going to stick some little gardens back there. Some more buildings over here, I think and some formal plazas and gardens out front of the building. And down below over here, we're going to stick some, I mean, definitely more gardens, but I think I want to have a little, a nice covered pavilion area around here with grass and enchanted trees and everything. Because it would be a nice place to view the city from here. I mean, that's a really good view, actually. So you can just picture yourself enjoying a nice evening meal here, enjoying the sea breezes. Be quite nice. So now that I brought you up to speed on everything I've done in Arudin around here, the next thing I actually want to do is drop out of Minecraft for a little bit because I have some things in World Painter I want to show you, as well as a few concept images that I started with, because I want to explain to you what I've been doing to expand the map for the future to create the moon of Norath, which is called Lucklin. Okay, so by way of introduction, for those of you that don't know, this is the original concept art for the Shadows of Lucklin expansion for EverQuest, which was a moon of Norath. And let me explain the overview here. This little thing down here describes the interior of the moon. And this area up here is an attempt to render its surface. Now, as you can tell, this is not a Minecraft map. So we immediately have a, a bit of a problem. Because we need to find some way to flatten this into a square or rectangular map. And lay out the zone connections and everything here. but. As I've said, this is a concept map. It doesn't exactly represent reality, either in the game or topographically, which is kind of good because that gives me some creative license, which, of course, as you know, uh, I use whenever possible. Uh, and before we move on from this, we also want to remark down here we have a concept art for the Vashir, which is the cat people. I'm pointing this out because... You've seen me remark about Kara Island, which is very close to Arudin. And if you remember the hole that we visited, during that explosion, some of them were transported 
to Lucklin from that area of Noriath. And this is where they built their city down here, Charval. It's made inside of a crater. Presumably where the chunk that was blown off of the crust of Noriath landed. Um, now, I think it was... I, I, it must have been teleported there somehow, actually, because I don't know how they would survive the trip. Uh, but regardless, a number of uh, Vashir kept people did survive, and they built up their own civilization in, in this area. But we'll be taking a look at that um, shortly, so I just wanted to remark on that. There's also some art up here that's very nice for the Shisar, which are, of course, the snake people, uh, as you can guess, and uh, they are not nice people. We will be hearing more about them whenever I build the Kunark expansion. Or rather, I have built the, the continent of Kunark, but I haven't built anything on the continent yet. And they are in this area over here, which is the Prey. So, moving on from that, here's the concept art down here below. And let me show you my original design over here. I did this in MS Paint because this is how I rough things out. And this is sort of a, a color-coded concept area to flatten this out, but sort of keep the, keep the spirit of it, but render it into something that's going to be in Minecraft. And down here is all the underground areas that are, this area I pointed out over here, are going to be all in this central section here. We're going to have the nexus here, which is where you teleport into the map from Norath. The city of Shadowhaven will be down here, and over here is going to be Claudal Caverns. And then we're going to have, like, the Deep and the Echo Caverns and Fungus Grove, and that's all going to be around here. Uh, these red lines are the Netherbean Layer, which is a hallway, sort of a very long pillared hallway. that is sort of like an underground subway system of sorts that connects the Nexus and the Shadowhaven area to the surface areas. And before we move on from this, I will point out some high points of this. We're going to have uh, Sanctus Seru, which is going to be a large Roman-style city over here. We're going to have Cata Castellum, which is going to be a grand medieval city up here. And there's going to be a vampire castle over here. And we're going to have the uh, Corilla Grimling Mines over here. This area is going to be a mushroom forest beneath the uh, Tenebris Mountains. Up here is the largest body of water on Luckland, which is going to be the Twilight Sea. And it's immediately faced. It's got some nice fertile areas around it, but we're going to have a scarlet desert over here. The gray over here, which is sort of a, a low-pressure vacuum area, actually. You can't get into it without some enduring breath, or you will smuffocate. Over here, we have Mons Letalis, which is a very mountainous and harsh region. You pretty much uh, you can't survive in there for very long. And over here we have uh, Mara Seru, which is sort of like a, it's actually supposed to be a flat glassy plain, but I think I'm going to redo this and make it um, sort of like a Yellowstone type area, but a very large one. And down here we have the Dawn Shroud Peaks, which is going to be a nice jungle and fertile area. Going to have over here, so it's separated by a little lake between that and the Maiden's Eye and the Umbral Plains down here. This is the area of the Akiva race, which is the original race on Luckland. This is uh, Vexthal, will be down here. It's their capital city. And over here, we have uh, Shade Weaver's Thicket and Hollow Shade Moor around this area. And in the middle of that is the Vashir, capital city of Sharval in a crater. And I believe that actually covers all of that. So let's move on to when I... What I did was I took this and I made it sort of a, a grayscale height map and I put it into World Painter and I did a little smoothing out work on it and I made some, some craters and everything around here and we came up with this right here is a zoomed out orthogonal picture from World Painter which we'll be taking a look at in a moment an even more detailed one I've done since I've created this one. Over here, you can see the, the Charval crater around here. You can see the, the Twilight Sea up here, uh, a bit of Mons Letalis around here, Scarlet Desert, and so on and so forth. So let's uh, move on from this to this right here, which will give you a view 
of where this is going to be in the map. It's going to be separated from Norath by a void area because the, you know, the moon is in space, so we kind of have to have that. Uh, but this is zoomed out in scale to the planet, by the way, so you can see just how big this expansion is that I'm building. It's, it's like a quarter or a third, I think it's more like a quarter, of the size of Norath itself. So it is a rather large moon. And from here, I will zoom in to Norath a little bit, because up here, this is where we have been building today Erudin. And down here was the Enchanted Tree. And over here is Koinos, which I'm going to be getting to a bit later. We're going to do a little work over there today to break ground on that project. Over here is Freeport. And uh, way over here is Felwyth that we worked on quite a few episodes ago. So we'll zoom out all the way there. So you can see that everything is in scale. Uh, now, let me explain a few things about Luckland. You will notice that the right-hand side and the left-hand side look rather different from each other, and there is a reason. This is because the north pole of the moon, which is over here, always faces the sun. Uh, now, in order for this to occur, we have to resort to, we can explain some of it orbitally with mechanics, um, but it's not gravitationally stable, so we're going to have to resort to a bit of magic, unfortunately. But to get this effect, the only way I can think of to make it work is to have Luckland be in a polar orbit around Norath, meaning that if this is the equator of Norath, the, the moon is actually orbiting in a north-to-south direction that is perpendicular to the equator, which means that it, uh, it circles around the poles. Uh, and while it does this, this side here, this is tidally locked to Norath, so it will always face Norath with this face, but the orbit processes in such a way in a period of one year that the pole of Luckland will always be facing the sun, which is going to be in this direction over here. Which means that this is not the equator of Luckland. This is the equator. And this produces some interesting effects. And let's go ahead and go to World Painter so I can show you this and I'll explain the effects that this creates. All right, here we are in World Painter. This is the program I use with all the bells and whistles around here that creates the various things I use to make the terrain. Now, as I've said, Luckland has a few interesting characteristics. Because it is tidally locked to the sun, meaning the North Pole is over here, this area on the left-hand side gets rather hot, which means that in the lunar highlands up here, they are rather arid. In fact, they are pretty much directly modeled after moon terrain. That's why they're all gray with craters and everything. But the habitable areas of the moon are all in miles deep depressions that are much lower down because Luckland does have a breathable atmosphere in most places, but not in these highlands. The atmosphere is just too thin up here to breathe and survive on. Uh, it is there, but it is quite thin. But that means that the sun is always shining on the left side but it is darkness on the right side. But because it is very hot on the left and cold on the right, in the center here we would have uh, rather nice temperatures, which is where most of the liquid water is, actually. And some of the craters on the highlands here are filled with liquid water. And over here, as you can tell, we have frozen terrain. And the frozen terrain I have actually modeled on the surface of Pluto, having the broken up polygonal ice planes that will be at the extreme heights of the world. This is pretty much at build limit, all this ice, by the way. And over here we have the arid lunar terrain with no ice because it is too hot for ice to form. But in the middle here, we have uh, decently nice areas for water to condense. But what it does from here is it will flow down from these areas into these pools and into the rivers and back down into the depressions. 
Uh, and from there, we will have clouds and everything form from that water. And that is how the water cycle will operate on Lookland to keep it habitable. As you can see up here, we've got uh, two craters and they fill these little lakes here. And they've got little streams that go back into the Twilight Sea and refill that as well. And there's also underground areas that will have water flowing through it as well. I haven't finished uh, terraforming all those, by the way. There's going to be more more little rivers and everything up here that I'm going to put in. But again, as far as temperatures go, this is going to be the nice temperature area of Luckland because everything over here is going to be just deathly hot, pretty much. Because even if you could breathe the atmosphere up here on the surface, it would just be too hot to survive. So it's going to give you a bad time over there. But over here, everything is all cold and in darkness. But there are lower down areas that have sort of, you could say, uh, geothermal vents and residual uh, atmospheric heat from the other side that will come over and fill these valleys that will keep them at least reasonably livable, uh, though it will be uh, rather chilly. And I think the last thing I want to do on this is let's go over here and I can show you a 3D view of this and I can make it larger and zoom it out. This is how I get these large 3D views of everything, except it takes a while to render. So I'm going to let it all render in and then I'm going to come back and give you a little tour around the map. All right, everything has loaded in and this is as far as I can zoom out, but it's a little too far. Let's go back in a little. And it's um, rather large, so it's not exactly responsive. So bear with me a little here. Let's start down here with the only detailed work I've done so far, which is to make part of the sort of uh, Yellowstone geothermal area I talked about as the vision I have for Maris Seru down here. I've done a little bit of it. But I think after doing this, I want to do the whole area up like that and make it a really, really big area. You can see in the highlands up here, we have some craters. Some of them have double craters and craters that go collide into each other and craters that have formed inside other craters with little central peaks and everything down here. Pretty much just your standard lunar terrain over here. We have the beginnings of the Mons Letalis area. I believe the name roughly translates to um, Deadly Mountains or Mountains of Death or the Lethal Mountains, as it were. And I've just got lava down here at the moment, but I think what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to do the glass trick, but I'm going to make it be a gray glass. I'm going to empty the lava out, and it'll be just a straight pit that goes down, but a big long crack down there that looks like it has sort of glowing fog at the bottom of it it'll be pretty neat and over here from that we have the large zone of the gray this is the dominion of the shisar that i pointed out to you the snake people they have a central large pyramid here i think i'm going to add several more pyramids around here though like a sort of egyptian style over here but their realm you can just not get into it because they have enchanted the entire thing to be a near vacuum uh, which means there's pretty much no air to breathe inside of it um it has something to do with the the green mist that killed them all off on nora so that's a it's sort of a defense against that you could say and also to keep people out they're very xenophobic and any hapless adventurers that go into the gray and their pyramid uh, are usually never seen again because they're probably eaten, actually. It's not pleasant. And over here, we have what is going to be the Scarlet Desert area with a little cutout over here in a crater for Grieg's End. It's going to be sort of a uh, castle dungeon over here. And it's got some dried out riverbeds, and I think that's going to be a, a mesa and a red sand type area with a sort of savanna area down here that faces onto the Twilight Sea. And the Twilight Sea itself has several areas along here, and it, ha it has five islands and some rivers and fertile areas. This is going to be a place where if you want to set up a farm for something, that it would be a nice place to have that for, like, wheat or carrots or something. 
But we start getting in uh, past the daylight terminator, which is around here. It becomes very dark around this part of the map and very cold, which means all the water gets frozen up here on the tops of the plains. And around here, this is going to be where we're going to have the grand medieval city of Cata Castellum. And we're going to have another medieval cathedral probably around here, I think. And my vision for this is it's going to be a two-tier city. We're going to have a big wall down here and a big docks area, and another big wall over here, and then the upper area, another big wall around here. It's, uh, I think, mostly it's going to be a lot like Freeport, probably. I'll use many of the same things. And there's going to be uh, deep channels with little rivers that will go through the Tenebris Mountains, which is what this area is called. And I think over here somewhere... We're going to have a uh, vampire castle, a um, pretty cool haunted medieval vampire castle. Down over here, this is going to be the Gremling Forest, which is going to be a giant mushroom forest. I'm working on the prototypes for the mushrooms, but this huge area over here is going to be filled just from uh, wall to wall and peak to peak with mushrooms of all shapes and sizes. It's going to be quite cool. Because over here, it's inhabited uh, underground by gremlins, and the acrylo mines that they inhabit are going to be, the entrance is going to be over there. And over here, we have, uh, this is either hollow shade or shade weavers. I always get those two mixed up. I think it's hollow shade. Um, we have a river that comes down from the Tenebris Mountains. It flows through the gremlin forest and ends up in a little lake down here. I think I'm going to put a few more things around, maybe some smaller islands and everything. The only real terraforming I've done is to get all these mountains and side peaks done. I haven't done the valley floors yet, so that's why they still look plain. And it's going to have its own set of vegetation, which should probably share a lot of vegetation with uh, shade weavers over here. Shade weavers thicket. And in the middle here, in this large crater, which is, has the central peak and a, uh, a lake, sort of a moat around it, this is going to be where Charval is going to be, be, be built, which is the uh, capital city of the Vashir race, which are descended from the Karens of Norath. They're the cat people that I pointed out to you. And over here we have some, some more upland waste, the more uh, icy Pluto terrain around here. Uh, but separated from those and, and not technically accessible from shade weavers, is the Umbral Plains. I mean, I'm, I'm going to put in a few tunnels, but you, re you really can't get from here to here in a request, so that's why there's this big band area here. Um, but this is the Umbral Plains, and it's got a little river, and it's mostly a grassy area, but it's going to have some trees of different descriptions around here. I haven't made the models for those yet, so I can't tell you. But over here in this large crater is where we're going to put the Akivan city of Vexthal. There's going to be another Akiva city around here, but it's going to be a ruined city, though. It's going to mostly be underground in this area, below these craters. And that is in the Maiden's Eye area here, which is going to be a big dark forest, is what I plan for that. And it's got a little sea area here. And over here we have the, the Dawn Shroud Peaks area, which is going to be a jungle area. It's going to be quite fertile. Good place for farming also. Uh, and under here, I think around under this area is where Shadowhaven and the Nexus are going to be. When you teleport into this map um, from the spires that we will eventually build in Kunark, you're going to end up here. And the Netherbean layer, which is the tunnel that I pointed out with the red lines, will go underneath here and it will go over to the Scarlet Desert over here, but it will also end mostly at uh, Sanctus Seru which is going to be built in this little depression here between the, the Morris Seru and the Dawn Shroud Peaks over here. And as I remarked, this is going to be done in a grand uh, Roman style, similar to what I'm planning for Koinos. Uh, speaking of, that's uh, going to be our next stop because I have shown you pretty much everything there is to see in the Lucklin map here. This is all the work that I've gotten done on it so far, but I wanted to introduce you to this and give you the long introductory explanation. So hopefully those of you who 
Um, no EverQuest will be excited for it, and those of you who don't know it will also be excited for it because you can see what I've got planned and have in store. So with all that said, let's go over to Koinos. Welcome to the city of Koinos. Or is it Kinos? I'm not sure anyone knows how to pronounce that quite properly. But regardless, this is where the site of the city of Koinos is going to be constructed. As you can see, it's got the typical blank gravel and cobblestone foundation, but not for long because I am going to install the city walls. And as you can see behind me here, this city is going to be done in a Grand Roman style. Now, I'm not going to get as much done on this before the next release as I have in Arudin, but I do want to go ahead and add in the walls, hopefully some of the internal partitions, but at least the main walls done up around the city so there can be at least something here for you to come see but we're just going to be breaking ground on this project to get it started anyway so let's go over here and take a closer look at the walls themselves as you can see let's go around here actually where the lighting will be a bit better around here it's going to be done in a grand roman style as is obvious we have the walls here and the columns or sort of they're actually uh, pilasters that are incised into the walls here with nice roman arches and they've got big ashlar blocks here in the center made up of various different materials i've put on top of each other to give it a nice effect to it uh, I'm quite pleased with how that's come out. This was an earlier version of walls I did before I did the 3D walls that I used for Erudin. But for these, if you just want to have a flat wall, but you want to get more texture out of the wall, like instead of just using one block, you can stack your blocks up like this and make them... 2x4 or 2x3 or however long you need them to be and you can make a pattern out of them like that I think it comes out really well it's very it's very subtle and it's not overpowering so the pattern blends into the wall and you almost don't notice that it's there it's got that uh, just noticeable difference type effect to it and of course we have a very Roman themed gateway here. It's sort of a, uh, a small triumphal arch type decoration except it's stuck directly into the walls here. And as you can see here the pattern from the Roman temple I have taken that and sort of banded that and bent it around all the corners of the walls here to achieve the same effect on the top to give it a nice unified design language here. And in the walls here we do of course have our standard gateway. It's a double gateway we've got around here. And of course I've chosen bedrock for it because we want to have tough city walls and what is tougher in Minecraft than bedrock, right? So there's our top here. We've got the roof sections around here. And on top of that I did have a very plain design for this up here. It's over there actually. I'll show it to you in a minute. But I thought for the gateway it needed to be just a little bit more grand. So, I put these uh, empty colonnades just stuck on the top of that, blanking the two towers on the walls here, and up there as well. I'm a little divided whether I should fill them in with something or not. I do have another reference model where I tried filling them in with something. It didn't quite look as good as having them empty. So I don't know. These might stay empty and I might put something in this. I'm really not sure yet but it's something I have to think about um, but that is something that can be done in the future but for the moment what I'm going to be doing with these is the same process 
and MC Edit that I showed you when I built the walls of Rudin in I think the last episode. And I'm going to put those in along here. And then I'm going to turn the corners around here and build them along here. Now this section over here, I should remark, I'm going to be filling this in. I originally thought like a year ago when I was making this map and terraforming it that I wanted to have a little dock section on this portion of the city, but looking at it, I want to have more space inside the city, otherwise it's not going to be comparable to Freeport. So I'm going to be filling that in and extending the walls up against the mountains over there. Or rather, the, uh, the Quenos Hills is actually that uh, zone that is over there. And we'll be doing the walls around the sea here, at least in, in some sections. And we'll be dividing it off between uh, north and south Quenos. And maybe uh, east and west Quenos as well. I'm really not sure about that yet. I just want to put the main walls in today and I wanted to show them to you because I'm quite pleased with how these have come out. I've actually just finished doing the top things of that uh, this morning. So, let me show you the other wall segments I have around here. This is the repeating wall segment. As you can tell, it's got a central segment here, and these are three of those segments put side by side each other. This is sort of how I design my walls. I do them in a very uh, modular way. That way I can build one wall segment that I really like, and I put in a lot of work on the one segment, and then I just repeat it. And I've done the same here to make the side towers as well. And here up here is my original design for the tops of the towers. It just sort of has a pitched roof on the top here in between the crenellations and the battlements. And I'll be using that for the small corner towers that don't really need to be decorative and don't matter that much. But for the main gates, I wanted to put a colonnade on both of those. But we have for absolute sure run out of time today. So in between episodes, I'm going to be doing the walls of Quenos here. We'll take a look at that in the next episode. And then we'll return to Arudin and see the main library building and some more things around there. I know this was a fairly packed episode, but I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.